Good afternoon and welcome to the OR Today webinar series. We're excited to have over 370 registered attendees for today's webinar. Just a reminder to save the date for our fifth annual OR Today Live Surgical Conference 2019, which will take place on August 18th to 20th in Las Vegas. Join us to discover new opportunities, broaden your knowledge, and exchange ideas. Visit ortodaylive.com for more information. Let's kick off today's webinar by giving an OR Today Live surprise pack to the attendee that can tell me the answer to the following trivia question. In honor of OR Nurse Day next week, what is the name of the first school of nursing which opened in New York City in 1873? Answer now using the question feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to remind you today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education hour. To obtain your certificate, you must complete the post-webinar survey, which will appear immediately on your computer screen at the end of today's call. One lucky attendee will have the opportunity to win an Amazon gift card, courtesy of OR Today, just for completing the survey. Okay, and let's see who the winner of our OR Today Live surprise pack is. And it is Jaina Peary. Congratulations, Jaina. The correct answer is the Bellevue Hospital School of Nursing, which of course was established by Florence Nightingale. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, Rep Scrubs. Rep Scrubs offers vendor management and cost reduction solutions. The REP Scrub program provides assurance that every vendor entering a sterile department is wearing clean, prepackaged, disposable polypropylene scrubs dispensed on site, while shifting the expense of providing those scrubs back to the vendor. The REP Scrub system offers hospitals a unique way of improving infection prevention and adherence to regulatory guidelines, reducing costs and enabling hospitals to better control and manage vendor access. For more information, visit repscrubs.com. Our presenter today is Dr. John Coots, Chief Medical Officer at Rep Scrubs. John, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Linda. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. I'm thrilled to have you with us. My name is John Coots. I'm a vascular surgeon. I also serve as Chief Medical Advisor for Rep Scrubs. And I, as well as everyone on our team, are passionate about operating room attire. So let's get started. I love operating room and surgical history. So let's start with a little Philadelphia-based surgical history. On this slide, you will see a picture of the front of Pennsylvania Hospital. For those of you from Philadelphia who have experience with Philadelphia, this is located at 800 Spruce Street. And it's the first hospital in the entire country. In the front, in the beautifully manicured lawn, you can see William Penn, a statue of him right there. This hospital was founded in 1751, but it didn't take them long to realize they would need a room to perform procedures in. So they worked on that, and in 1801, they opened a room at the top of the main building specifically intended for operating room or surgical procedures. This slide to the right is a picture of the first operating room in the country. It's really remarkable if you look at it, and procedures were performed on a simple wooden table. This allows a theater for students and other physicians to watch. But what's most incredible about this picture is that they could only perform surgical procedures during daylight. They had a massive skylight in the ceiling, and it's represented on the slide on to the left, which basically demonstrates that with the arrow. Now, as time went on, they eventually put a chandelier here, which first had candles and then ultimately electricity. But this is pretty interesting, and if you're in Philadelphia, you can have an opportunity to tour this at Pennsylvania Hospital, which is part of the University of Pennsylvania Health System. Now, several blocks up the street at Jefferson Medical College, they also had developed an operating room, which followed the format of the surgical operating pits, for those of you who have a knowledge of surgical history. So if you look in the back here, you can see there are a lot of attendees, typically students, other physicians that are watching a surgical procedure being performed. This gentleman right here is Samuel Gross. He was the chairman of surgery at Jefferson Medical College. And the chair in that position now was named after him. 
This painting was done in 1875 by Thomas Eakins, who was arguably one of the most famous American painters ever. And this painting is purported to be his most famous piece of work. It was owned by Jefferson for years and sold about five to six years ago for $69 million. Now the painting was done in 1875 and I put it on here to highlight the attire that everyone is wearing. Samuel Gross literally is in a tuxedo or probably his day where I suspect he came off the street and walked right into the pit and started doing this procedure. You can see everyone else is in similar attire and they're performing a procedure on a wooden table once again with minimal draping and equipment that's over here. A couple of things for you art historians out there about this painting. Thomas Eakins included himself in the painting right here at this pulpit. This would be the record keeper. Eakins put himself in there. And over here is believed to be the mother or wife of the patient. So that's pretty interesting. Now across town, 14 years later, Eakins painted another painting of an operating room pit. And you can see once again, all of the students here dressed in street clothes. But there are some market differences, which we'll highlight in a second. But you can see that this is a little bit more formal than the previous slide. And if you put them side by side, you might be able to tell the differences, which I'm going to highlight here right now. Samuel Gross in the left is wearing street clothes. You know, 14 years later at the Agnew Clinic, they decided that maybe they should change things. Now they're all wearing white. For the first time, you see a nurse in attendance at the procedure as well. So in 14 years, a radical change took place just between the operating room attire and operating room personnel. Now, I, once again, I absolutely love surgical history, so I thought I'd put on some slides here really to show the evolution and progression of the operating room throughout time. You know, here in the 1950s, this is obviously a religious-based uh, facility, likely a Catholic hospital. You can see that things have progressed. Now we have overhead lighting. We are wearing, we are, everybody is wearing clothing. The table is a little bit more complex. There's a table holding instruments. And there are two nurses. Now it's hard to tell really if either of these nurses are assisting the procedure or if they're just in the room providing assistance to the staff. You know, as time went on in the 80s, you can see once again, complexity of the operating room environment began to change. You know, people started wearing more elaborate OR attire, the lighting improved, the anesthesia equipment improved. We had more direct link to the surgical equipment. They had the mail stand on the operative field, and everybody is engaged with a lot more folks. You know, today, this is more representative of present day operating. We have monitors, complex laparoscopic robotic procedures. There's always an assistant in the room, lots of audio visual equipment. And for orthopedics, we have power tools. They have complete uh, scrub attire to protect themselves and the patient. Now, this next slide, I think, really highlights how different the operating room is from that first picture you saw at Pennsylvania Hospital. So when these pictures come up, think back to that table on that skylight and realize how different things are now. And if you go to Philadelphia and look at that operating room, really, and think of how much things have changed in 220 years, it's really remarkable. This is a hybrid vascular operating room. I was in one of these rooms yesterday doing procedures, and it's incredibly complex. This is all imaging equipment. This is a monitor that not only provides me data as to what I'm doing, but it has dynamic capability, meaning I can see vital signs, patient input data. Back here on these monitors, I can put old studies or bring up the electronic medical record to review old data. These, this is a power injector unit. There's an anesthesia machine back here. This is the Pixis. You know, back here are all the servers for this complicated equipment. And, and it's incredible how much space they occupy, but without them, none of this works and everyone's fascinated with robotic surgery. You know, here you can see two surgeons operating robotically. They're not even at the side of the patient. The machine here almost looks like a big spider. This is a scrub operating room nurse assistant likely, and her job really is just to make sure this robot doesn't malfunction. And these, and these surgeons never leave this field. They operate remotely. So you can see if you compare that to 1801 at Pennsylvania Hospital, 
it's almost hard to believe it's science fiction if you saw these pictures in 1985 you would say man that's from a spaceship now over time procedure complexity has skyrocketed and this picture really represents all the different types of operative procedures which involve prosthetic devices from total joint replacements to endovascular implants to aortic endovascular grafts both in the thoracic and abdominal aorta transcatheter aortic valve replacement carotid stenting open aortic valve replacement which they still do robotic surgery spinal implants laparoscopic and robotic procedures total hip arthroplasty and laparoscopic procedures and this really takes us back to a review of operating room personnel throughout time. You know, in the late 1800s, those slides that I originally presented, you know, the staff was pretty slim in the operating room. You know, we originally would have a surgeon. There might be an anesthesia provider. Usually it was just somebody up there talking to the patient. You had the students surrounding them in the operating room pits so that they could learn. There may or may not have been an attending nurse, but almost always back in the 1800s, there was an audience in any teaching facility. Now, as time progressed, the operating room personnel changed. And you know, there's always a surgeon, and over time, an anesthesia provider became a mainstay. Now, that could either be a physician or a nurse. A nurse assistant became part of the process, either to help with the operation or to circulate in the operating room and provide assistance obtaining equipment. So below that, you can see a circulating nurse, and that would depend on the size and type of the hospital. So if you were in a larger facility in the 50s in a tertiary care center, you almost assuredly would have a circulating nurse. But if you were in a small community hospital, the odds are your nurse would help you, and when you needed something, she would have to scrub out, go get it, come back in the operating room and scrub back in. Procedure complexity has really resulted in a significant change in the operating room staff and personnel and exponentially increased who is present in the operating room. But once again, you always have the surgeon and an anesthesia provider, but assistance is something that is involved in every procedure anymore. And that can either be a physician, a nurse, or a technologist, depending on your facility. Circulating nurse staff is either one or two because the procedures have become so complicated that having one nurse circulate to get all the equipment sometimes just isn't enough. And when you're doing a complex robotic endovascular um, transcatheter-based procedure, a lot of times you need a lot of help to get all of that equipment on the table or to make sure you have it. And based on that procedure complexity, if you remember that slide I showed a little bit ago with all those devices, well, all of those devices unquestionably have a device or vendor representative with them. And what they do is basically ensure that the device is used based upon the instructions for use, make sure the surgeon and the team have the appropriate device, and answer any questions related to implantation. So, this slide really depicts that the volume of operating room staff and personnel has markedly increased and that's directly as a result of procedural complexity and the frequent process of prosthetic device implantation operating room staff from surgeons to transporters typically arrive at work in street clothes and change into a pair of commercially laundered operating room scrubs and I, we bring this up now, we're transitioning from, you know, what, you know, the operating room staff and the procedures now to operating room attire. And you know, when personnel are finished with scrubs, they traditionally change back into street clothes and place the operating room scrubs in a linen basket. Some facilities have vending machine platforms for scrubs or personnel who dispense the scrubs. You know, the overwhelming majority of facilities have minimal, if any, oversight on scrub utilization. Regardless, most operating room staff follow the simple process well. And I put this picture up here, really, I think anybody who's been in an operating room has seen this scene repeated over and over and over in all of your ORs. So here you have a simple cabinet, 
the color here depicts your scrub size. You look for that color, you grab the scrubs off the shelf. When you're done, you throw them in the linen basket. This is just another platform where it's a basket type. You just have the scrubs in there. You see the size printed on the front. You reach in and grab your scrubs. You know, well then what's the issue? This is a classic commercial from the 80s. Where's the beef for Wendy's? You know, where's the beef? What's the problem? Well, the issue is that the increasing complexity of operative procedures and, implanta and implantation of prostheses requires an enlarging population of vendor and product representatives to really support the process. You know, most hospital personnel, meaning surgeons, nurses, anesthetists, staff, you know, most of those personnel who change in the scrubs never leave that facility. They come to work, change in the scrubs, do their job. When they're done, they take the scrubs off, change back into their street clothes, and walk out the door. You know, the vendor and product representatives may visit one or many facilities during the course of their day. I bring this slide up again because I think it's important to realize that vendor and product representatives may visit one or many facilities during the course of their day. Now, that is a significant distinction from hospital staff personnel. You know, those people come and change into their scrubs and they are there. The vendor and product representatives may be at one hospital, they may go to another hospital, they may stay at your hospital, but we really don't know. You know, and that's, that relates back to the point of this system, which, you know, this is an honor system and works relatively well, but, you know, there really is no accurate way to determine, hey, who came into my operating room and took scrubs? How do I manage inventory? I mean, you may come in, and this happens all the time, the popular sizes like large, they're gone. And we, you, know, you don't even know where they are. And the inventory can be abysmal. You don't even no idea who returned your scrubs. I mean, counting on people to throw them in the linen baskets, the honor system, but we all know that sometimes that just doesn't work well. You know, and how many pairs of scrubs a single person takes? I, I can tell you, I've seen people walk up, take the, the entire, package of these pants and shirts and walk right out the door with them. And it's hard to tell who they are, what they're doing. You know, and this I think is how, or the title of our talk is, how do street, are street scrubs contaminating your OR? This is how street scrubs enter your OR. You know, medical device and sales representatives and vendor reps are a population that typically are unregulated and not held accountable to the, to the same standards of all the hospital staff and personnel. You know, there are over half a million surgical sales representatives nationally, and that number continues to increase as more products are developed and the complexity of those products increases, you need more reps. And if you remember a couple of slides ago, there may be devices that are inserted, for example, a transcatheter aortic valve replacement. That procedure will have four to five reps present for each one of those because it's a novel procedure right now. So in the beginning, you'll have multiple representatives there to support the process. You know, and 55 to 60% of all surgical procedures, if you look here, they'll have a rep in it. And that could be anything from a hernia repair to a joint replacement, to a prosthetic bypass graft, to a valve replacement for your heart. You know, it, or even some interventional procedures, dialysis catheter implantation, pick line insertion. A lot of times the reps go to support this process and make sure that their device and product is utilized appropriately and correctly and staff have what they need. You know, if you look to the orthopedic world, over 90% of all total joint orthopedic procedures have a vendor representative present. Many vendors wear their own street scrubs. And if you look over here at this picture, you can see, I mean, here we have somebody pumping gas in their scrubs, and they may have taken them from your hospital, they're pumping gas, getting in the car and going to another hospital. And this goes back to the fact that they visit multiple hospitals and elsewhere during their workday. They often blend in with the surgical staff, and they avoid the inefficiency of changing into clean scrubs before entering the sterile patient carrier. So, you know, they'll walk out of your hospital, go get gas, walk into your hospital, go right through the locker room and right into your operating room. You know, the scrubs aren't properly laundered, they potentially contaminate sterile patient care areas, and they clearly violate the typical honor system of hospital sterile protocol. 
So are vendors and street scrubs contaminating your operating room? Well, it's not just about contamination, but we'll highlight that and start with that. Meaning, what's on these scrubs? And really, this is a two-way process. You know, not only we hear we're at the gas station, but not only what's on these scrubs, meaning what did this rep leave the operating room with on these scrubs and then enter the community? And then what did he take from the community back into the operating room or what did he take from the first operating room into the second operating room, if you can imagine this? Meaning he was in a procedure at hospital A, left that hospital, got in his car, stopped to get gas, took whatever he had on his scrubs from the hospital and now brought it into the community and then went into hospital B. So anything from hospital A is now in hospital B, anything from hospital A is now in the environment, and anything in the environment is now back in hospital B. It's really, if you think about it from an epidemiologic perspective, it's mind boggling and frightening. But not only that, as you remember back to the slide about all the scrubs, you know, who is this? I mean, I'm sure we, those of us who are in operating rooms all the time, people come and go in operating rooms and you have no idea who they are. They look official, they have a pair of scrubs on, but you know, no one really knows who's in there. And not only that, hospitals spend thousands of dollars every month managing their scrub inventory. They know that they're gonna lose money maintaining scrubs, but it's a cost of doing business for them. So really there are three issues, contamination risk, vendor management, and cost savings. I mean, this slide I think depicts what really we just talked about and what we're highlighting. I mean, these are folks in scrubs in all kinds of areas in the public, you know, from an airport to the grocery store, to the subway, to another airport, gas station, the gym, airport, I mean, coffee. I mean, th these are places that we are all in every day. So, you know, once again, if you look, if you imagine if this person was in an operating room and now is at the airport or in the coffee shop, they're taking everything from that operating room and putting it there. And then if they go back in the operating room and taking everything from the, from the coffee shop back in with them. You know, the governing bodies agree, you know, this is a hot topic in medicine right now, and infection control is really garnering a lot of attention. The American College of Surgeons about two years ago put out a statement that clearly said, operating room scrubs should not be worn in the hospital facility outside of the OR area without a clean lab coat or appropriate cover-up. So a lot of folks will go to lunch, they'll put on a lab coat or a scrub coat to cover those scrubs and then come back. And, and here they said, OR scrubs should not be worn at any time outside of the hospital perimeter. You know, for those of us who spend a lot of time at tertiary care facilities, you walk down the street at any big hospital in any big city, you're going to see people walking all over the place in scrubs. And you don't know if they're going back in the operating room, if they're support staff, if they're reps, you just don't know. You know, infection control today highlighted it, and the American Operating Room Nurses Association urges healthcare providers to examine this. I mean, this is a hot, hot, hot topic. You know, hospital acquired infections have been linked to operating room attire. I mean, Wall Street Journal brought this up. Um, infection control journals brought this up. But if you look at this slide in the center, it's really scary. 92% of scrubs worn by hospital personnel are carrying dangerous bacteria, including MRSA, VRE and C. diff by the end of every workshift. So that by the end of the eight hour workshift, 92% of scrubs worn in that hospital are contaminated. 79% of unwashed operating room scrub swatches were contaminated with some type of gram positive coxi. 69% of these tested positive for coliform bacteria, which really is colonic bacteria. Here we have a study where three patients following open heart surgery developed a sternal wound infection. You know, the hospital did a root cause analysis of this and found the common denominator in those three patients was an anesthetist. The wounds grew Gordonia bronchialis and all patients required multiple procedures. That is an example of how scrubs can impact patient care. So we're gonna kind of go on to that these next few slides. So you know, there's no regulatory policy or quality inspection measures that address surgical attire. And I'm gonna read this quote to you just so that you, know, you can digest it. 
Though the scientific contribution of this study supports and builds on previous research that healthcare providers' uniforms can be vectors that spread infections not only within hospitals, but also potentially within communities. Therefore, further research and policy that address this topic is imperative to protecting patients, healthcare providers, and the health of the public. And if you go back to that slide where you saw the folks in scrubs all over the place, I mean, really, it's the community that we're talking about also. I mean, you know, therefore, further research and policy that addresses this topic is imperative to protecting not only the patients and providers, but the health of the public. And this is the Journal of Public Health and Epidemiology. You know, this is not only a significant threat to patients and hospitals health, but really it's the threat to the hospital economic balance. And hospital acquired infections have become incredibly scrutinized over the last few years. And here you can see some data, a central line infection in your average intensive care unit patient cost the hospital probably $49,000. The ventilator associated pneumonia, 43,000. A urinary tract infection, you might get away with $962 but if they have a protracted course, I think it's going to be a lot more money. But a surgical site infection is $23,000. And quite frankly, I think that number is conservative. But that includes the entire spectrum from a simple infection that you open at the bedside or in your office to somebody who requires multiple operative procedures and debridements. And, you know, this number is likely an average. But I think the, on, the other, on the high side of that, the surgical site infection could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, and this is a critical issue impacting reimbursement. And if you look at these numbers, they're, they're frightening. 35 to $45 billion in annual direct costs related to hospital acquired infections. Yeah, and this is why Medicare has clamped down on this and they, they do MRSA swabbing. Uh, they won't pay for a, a urinary tract infection if you get it in the hospital. I mean, this 35 to 45 billion in acute care hospitals, 28 to 33 billion in non-acute care hospitals. These numbers are staggering. You know, healthcare.gov estimates that one in 20 patients receiving care in a hospital will acquire an infection. I'm going to tell you, I think that number is incredibly conservative if you add in all the type of infections patients may unfortunately get. I, I always tell my patients, they say, you know, a hospital is for sick people. If you're well and you're a surgical patient, you can go home, go home, because you don't want to be one in these 20 patients, because if you get C. diff or pneumonia, you know, it could be catastrophic. So, you know, our product is Rep Scrubs. And, you know, we, I, this slide says Rep Scrubs to the rescue. You know, we're kind of on the white horse here in the cavalry. But in some sense, really we are. And it answers the three questions. If you remember that slide, the gentleman pumping gas, the three questions were A, infection control. You know, what's on those scrubs? What did he take from one OR into the community and then from the community back to the OR? The cost, hospitals spend thousands every quarter, every month, replacing scrubs that they know they're never going to see again. And vendor management. I mean, this is really another big issue in the operating room. Who is in your OR for how long and why? I think, you know, from a vendor management safety and security aspect, this is really important. So here, this is the rep scrub solution. You know, infection prevention, which we've really highlighted. You know, enhance sterile protocols and reduce hospital acquired infections. And if you look back on that slide, the 35 to 45 billion dollars, any amount of money you can help save could be put into other healthcare initiatives. You know, we could go into preventive medicine, we could develop protocols, we could immunize, we could spend that money in such other ways instead of managing hospital acquired infections that may have been capable of being prevented from the start. You know, not only that, we can monitor and manage vendor traffic. I mean, this, for those of you who spend time in an operating room, you all know people walking around the operating room, we just don't need the extra traffic. And I'm a chairman of surgery in my hospital. I am a big stickler about this. I do not like extra traffic in the operating room. If you have a reason to be there, fine. But if you don't, I don't want you in there. Um, not only that, it costs money. Inventory and expense reduction. I mean, there's nothing worse than going in to get change into your scrubs and all the large scrubs are gone and you don't know why. Somebody could have stolen them, they could, who knows? And you know, reduce lost and stolen scrub inventory. So here's the rep scrubs process. You know, the hospital says we are burdened and overwhelmed with vendor management and scrubs in our hospital. Let's start the rep scrubs solution. So 
we put a port in the hospital, which really looks like a fancy vending machine. We have the rep register online, they pay an annualized fee, and that gives them access to operating room attire. We're gonna go over this in a second, so I know this, you, you, everybody wants to kind of see that. But what it really does is make sure that everybody's compliant and safe. So, you know, once we get this scrub port, now we've, we've answered a lot of those questions you saw in previous slides where, hey, this, this person deserves to be there. They're in clean scrubs. They're not impacting the scrub inventory for the hospital staff, and they're compliant and safe. So here's the solution. So here's the rep scrub support. Once again, it's a fancy vending machine, but really this vending machine has a lot of moving parts in it. So right here where you, where you have signed up, it's a web-based process. You put in your pin, out drops, your pair of scrubs and identification. So, you know, we're going to go over that. Let's focus on the scrubs right here. You know, Rep Scrubs has, excuse me, has provided in the past lab coats and coveralls, but the scrubs really are the main focus. Now, in each is individually packaged, and when you open that, and they're size based, when you open that package, out come a pair of polypropylene scrubs. You have a top, a bottom, you have a logo on it, a, a hat and booties. And what that does is provide an individual who now is wearing a clean pair of scrubs. We know what he is doing and why he is there because he's logged in with his web-based signature. The red bouffant cap identifies him as do the long sleeve blue scrubs. <clears throat> then that machine will dispense also a name tag. And this is really a critical part of this. This, this is what provides absolute security. The name tag will have the vendor's name and what device company they're with and what hospital they're in and the day and time that they acquired this badge. They take that badge and peel off the back and put it on the front of their scrubs. Now, once they do that, a time sensitive ink starts to work that in eight hours will produce this badge down here. So you start with this at time zero. This is time zero plus eight hours. You have an expired badge, which means your vendor's been there for eight hours and everybody needs to know that. They know who he is, where he's from, what facility he is in, and that he's been there for eight hours. Meaning you can't leave the one facility in this pair of scrubs because it is a unique identifier. And you have to, after eight hours, either buy a new pair of scrubs or take those off and you know, finish what you're doing in that facility. So this makes this product with this name badge unique to that facility where the vendor is, meaning that vendor cannot now leave your facility with these scrubs. He has to take them off in a, and throw them away in a, in a bin that collects them and they're capable of being recycled. So they're environmentally friendly, which is important also. So really this is the magic of it. It's not just the scrubs, but now we're identifying everybody. So on the next slide, you're going to see that how important that is. So, you know, the OR managers, chairman of surgery, hospital administration can get immediate daily and weekly reporting, meaning who's there? What time did they get there? What time did they sign out? Were they compliant? What company do they represent? So now the security component of who is in your operating room and why they're there has been solved. So not only have we solved the scrub solution, not only have we made the rep identifiable by their attire and their name badge, we've now also provided to the hospital and administration and staff a complete vendor management solution. So now you know who's there and why. And it's amazing from an administrative perspective how many folks don't know how frequently certain vendors are there. And I think not only does it benefit the hospital, but it benefits that vendor, meaning he now knows how long he's in that hospital. He or she now know how long they have been in that facility. And it can help them with time management as well. So it's not just a one-sided benefit, really. It's a two-sided benefit because they can help develop efficiencies or learn where they're spending the majority of their time. And here is somewhat of an example of a worksheet. And you know, up here it has the hospital. Here it has the number of companies that have signed in to that scrub port. And if you look here at you know, all the companies, how many times they've visited the hospital and who the representative is. 
who they work for, and how many times they visited the hospital. You know, you get how many scrubs per day are ported out, how many visits per month. You can develop metrics to see how many reps are in your operating room on what days, and then you can chart that out, which quite frankly, I think is important for all operating rooms to know who's in their operating room, why they're there, for how long, who they represent, and are they in clean attire? So it's not just about the clean attire, but it's also about the vendor management, the cost savings, and the infection control. You know, the initial impact of rep scrubs that we've seen is a 22% reduction in vendor traffic. And that goes back to that last slide, which we just talked about, which is, you know, now vendors have an idea of where they're spending their time. And they're either going to make their time worthwhile and, put, and spend it where they need to, or not. And I think that's an important thing for them to know. It's not just about the operating room and vendor management from who's going to be in my OR, but it also helps the vendors. The increased visibility of the vendor, and if you remember back to that slide, I can go back in a second to highlight it. The scrubs are blue, they're navy blue, they're polypropylene, they're long sleeve. You have a red bouffant cap and booties. And right across the front is your name. And I think that provides the visibility of the vendor it improves interaction and compliance, and it really takes away the ability of the vendor to blend into the operating room environment and provide that potential for infection, uh, infection from the outside world to change that uh, vendor management solution that we talked about, and also from a cost perspective. So, you know, you reduce the costs, you increase the visibility of the vendor to reduce infection, and you reduce vendor traffic. And, you know, if you go back to this slide, I'm going to go backwards. I know people don't always like that. If you go back to this slide, I mean, here you can see, you know, this is what the vendors look like. And the vendors universally like this, you know, for the most part. They like the idea that they now have clean, a clean set of scrubs to where everybody knows their name. They stand out. People know that they're a rep. And that way they represent their company well. There's no, there's no question who they're from. So if this rep is walking down the hall and it says gore medical you know people go up to them and say oh you're from gore i need you know i need to talk to you about this device it really improves interaction and compliance and overall i think has been an incredible shift in those hospitals that have adopted the technology but that's really what we have today um, in, on this slide is my contact information there's email addresses on here for myself personally for you can direct email to Rep Scrubs for the webinar. You can also visit our website at repscrubs.com. If you have questions that you think need to be answered in person, you can give a call up to Rep Scrubs and extension 709, and your question will be answered in person. I hope you enjoyed everything we talked about. I love operating room history and operating room attire and operating room sterility. I really enjoyed presenting this today. If you have any questions, just let us know, and otherwise, have a great day. Thanks again. Thank you very much, John. I've actually got a, a couple of questions that have come in. Um, uh, what new information did the, the presentation provide? For the audience, you mean, Linda? Yeah. I think, you know, for those, is it okay if I go back on the slides? You do whatever you want. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, I think for those people who have never been in an operating room, environment i think this is really an eye-opening experience and i've spoke you know i speak to a lot of folks every day and most people don't understand the process of vendor representation in the operating room you know i think there's this blind trust that you know you go into an operating room and everything that's happening there really is happening for your best interest and you would expect it to be that way you know but unfortunately with the fast pace of the competitive vendor world, you know, these men and women are out there really trying to do the highest volume that they can because that's part of their economic viability. And as a result, they're in and out of multiple facilities, but that time management impacts each facility that they're in. So the staff that comes to that hospital and changes into OR garb every day is a lot different than the rep that comes in and out. And I, I think that what this presentation does is highlight to people what's really happening in the operator so that they get a better sense of what's important 
in terms of what I believe is important, which is OR sterile management environment and OR vendor uh, management, meaning who's in my operating room and why. And I don't think people really understand that unless you spend a lot of time in an operating room. Okay, I've got a question here. How did you come up with the eight hour expiration date on the use of scrub? You know, I think eight hours represents, well, a couple of things. One, eight hours represents the typical shift of time in, you know, in nurses, nursing staff still historically works seven to three, three to 11, 11 to seven. So I think anybody who's in the operating room longer than eight hours, um, typically that's the average work day for them. You know, it's unusual for a vendor rep, uh, vendor or rep to be in the operating room itself proper for longer than eight hours. And if they're there longer than eight hours, I think from the perspective of infection management, then maybe they should change into a new pair of scrubs. I can tell you that universally, most reps only wear one pair of scrubs to that hospital for that visit. There's no real scientific data that guides the eight hour time frame. I think it really was designed for the typical eight hour workday that exists in an operating room. Okay, this actually leads on to it. It says, is the eight hour time limit adjustable? Say you wanted to do four hours. Uh, you know, that's a great question. The eight hour time limit is not adjustable. So the, the vendor badge is time sensitive to eight hours. So it'll start to it'll start to change that ink over time once you take this, you know, once you take the badge off. But basically what it does is provide that rep one pair of scrubs for that eight hour period for that operating room. So, you know, if they're going to be in that operating room all day, they buy that pair of scrubs, they own them for eight hours. So there's no opportunity to change less time because, you know, if you change less time, you may need more time. So we felt an eight hour window provided the maximal typical time for that vendor or rep to use that pair of scrubs. Okay, and is this just the vendors or can it expand for all staff to use? Well, uh, that's an excellent question. And the, my passion would be that everybody use it ultimately. I, I think the most, you know, the, the initial push really and the most unregulated and not held accountable population, which I brought this slide up for that purpose, you know, vendor representatives are the ones that are in and out of operating rooms more frequently than the typical hospital staff who comes, changes, and stays there all day. I, I think the future for this could potentially push into everyone wearing them. You know, from an epidemiologic and infection control perspective, it would be wonderful if everybody wore them. I think in the beginning, really the biggest push is to manage a population that is transient in the operating room, that come and go, and that we can control first. But my goal, my passion, my dream would be that everybody wear them. But I think we're a little bit way off from that, but maybe not as far as we think. But that's a great question. Okay, and it's slightly different. Have you piloted studies in a facility and what were results noted? So we, you know, we have anecdotal data. Do we have a study that can directly, you know, do we have a scientific objective evidence-based study that can directly link these two processes? We have anecdotal data and which I presented here in this slide. Do we have a study that says this person carrying these scrubs in this OR caused this infection? We don't have that yet. And we're looking to get that accomplished. And we've had a lot of meetings to work on funding to have that done. But I don't have that direct scientific link. I have a lot of anecdotal data. I have common sense data. But I don't have that study which provides if this person comes in this OR and they have this on their scrubs, will that patient get an infection? What will it cost and what is the impact? I don't have that yet. And honestly, that might not be easy to accomplish given the sensitivity of hospital acquired infections and their management. But to answer the question, no, I don't have that scientific study. Okay. <laughs> what about, is there any data showing a decrease in SSIs yet? Uh, in surgical site infections, we have anecdotal data. We don't have a direct scientific paper that can link it, but we have anecdotal data that unquestionably provides data that says, look, when reps come in the operating room and wear our scrubs, our infection rate has decreased. And you know, all hospitals manage surgical site infections, 
And you know, we've had multiple reports from multiple facilities that say, look, once we got this program in place, our surgical site infection decreased. So I think it's been out there, it's out there and it's well known, which is important. Okay. Um, going back to the vendors, are, are the vendors close enough to the patient to cause a surgical contamination for their scrubs to matter? Yeah, absolutely. Let me, I mean, you know, th th this is a major passion of mine. And anybody who comes into an operating room has the opportunity to, in my perspective, infect that patient. And you know, I implant prostheses all day long, and a prosthetic implantation infection occurs 90% of the time at the time of implantation. And any variable that can impact that can cause an infection. So if that's somebody opening the door uh, that doesn't belong in that room, if it's somebody coming in the room with a t-shirt on under their scrubs, if it's somebody who is just doing, performing a grossly contaminated case and comes in my operating room with the same scrubs on, all of those things to me are real big no-nos. And people in my operating room know, I don't like extra traffic, don't come in my room with dirty scrubs, don't come in my room unless you have clean scrubs on. So the, the vendor and product representatives can be close enough to the patient without question. Are they, are they bedside during the procedure? No. Are they within a, di a radius of the patient? Absolutely. And I think that's what I, most people who aren't in the room every day don't understand that these folks are providing direct support and they are needed to help accomplish a lot of these procedures because of the devices, making sure we have the right device, making sure it's being used correctly. So yeah, I believe absolutely they do. Okay, now, uh, I'm an attendee wants to know, some hospitals allow home laundered scrubs and the bacteria count is like that of diapers laundered at home. Do you have any data on that? Well, you know, we know that home, and a lot of folks do home launder their scrubs, which makes me cringe, quite frankly, because you're taking everything from the hospital into your home. Um, and a lot of people do it for convenience, but you know, C. diff cannot be killed with a home laundered system. It can't, the, the water isn't hot enough. You know, VRE which is very hard to kill in a home laundered system. So you know, if you think about it, if you work in an, in an environment where you have MRSA, VRE, C. diff, you know, all of these other bacteria that are coming, you know, becoming more prominent, you take them on your scrubs, you throw them in your washing machine with your children's clothes, and then take them out, there's no way. So, you know, a lot of hospitals don't know what's happening, but that's why a lot of hospitals work on this honor system, which is you come in, you change in the scrubs, you take them off, you go home. But home laundering scrubs, I think, really should be something that is not done at all. Okay. Um, some cases last well over eight hours. So are reps expected to change during a case if participating according to protocols? I think that would be the ideal. You know, I think it depends on how long it's expected that the rep be in there. And, you know, if it's going to be another hour or so, then, you know, from, I don't know that it's a big issue. Really the time expiration stamp is to let people know that they've been there a minimum of eight hours. I think if the rep is going to be there another four or five hours, they should consider whether they should change based on their exposure and time. But I think the time stamp expiration is really to say to everybody who sees it, look, that person has been here eight hours. You need to know that. So, you know, I think a short period of time after that is okay. If they're going to be there for another four, five, six hours, I think it's something that should be addressed. Is it a mandate? I don't think so. I think the timestamp is really to let everybody know that guy's been, that guy or girl, excuse me, has been here eight hours, and you need to know that. Okay, and keeping on that subject, when a vendor is identified as wearing expired scrubs, what is the formal process for removal? Uh, does surgical service own this or hospital security? Uh, so within the operating room there, and I just we just don't have a picture of it on the presentation. I apologize about that. There's a you know there's a mechanism by which the rep disposes of the scrubs. The scrubs can then be gathered and um, recycled. So there is an there's a whole process. It's not. There's no security involved in that. Once they take off those scrubs, they put them in a waste uh, control uh, basket and they're gathered. That's managed by the hospital. And then the rep puts on their street clothes and walks out. OK. 
Okay, and we've got one about surgeons here. So surgeons also travel between facilities, patient rooms and departments. Wouldn't that also be a good trial? <laughs> absolutely. Uh, without a question, it would absolutely be one. Surgeons do this all the time. You know, I change my scrubs between every single case that I do, and if I leave the operating room and come back, even if I'm covered up, I change my scrubs. You know, we kind of count on surgeons to have that honor code about them. You know, there are some surgeons that just don't believe that this is an this has an impact, and there are some who be implant prosthetics all day, like myself, who are incredibly compulsive about it. But to answer the question, I would love to do that study. Uh, getting it accomplished so far, we haven't had the opportunity to do that, but Hopefully that's some part in our future, but we're all, we've all discussed that at our company and I think it's something that I would love to see. Okay, so what do you advise the staff who state they're allergic to the detergent used by the professional laundry? Oh boy, that, that's probably in response to the home laundering. I think, you know, that, that's a tough scenario. I, I personally haven't seen that that often, but I think, I don't know if I have a great answer for that. I, I haven't seen it that often. I'm sure it happens, but maybe they could talk to the hospital or the scrub uh, commercial vendor and say, look, is there an opportunity for me to do something different than the mass scrub population? You know, I, I understand people's concern that they want to launder their scrubs if they have a sensitivity. And I, I even myself understand that because they use all, they have a tendency to use a lot of starch uh, in some of the scrubs and they have a tendency to use very, aggressive material to make sure they're clean. Um, I think that that would fall on the facility themselves and, and I don't mean to say it like that. I understand both sides of that story, but I think, but more importantly, what people have to consider is they're taking their scrubs home, carrying with them everything that was in the hospital and now putting it into their washer and dryer, which really, if you think about it, you're not killing anything more than assuredly, you're just grossly cleaning your scrubs and then putting them back on and going back to work. So. I think the solution has to be worked out on the hospital side of that with the scrub uh, man management system. I, you know, I discourage folks from using that as rationale to home launder their scrubs because VRE, C. diff, and MRSA can be catastrophic and can absolutely be passed to family members, particularly those at the extremes of life, meaning young children and older folks. And uh, this happened to one of my mentors when I was a resident, and he took bacteria home to one of his children, and it was catastrophic, and this was in the 1980s. So, you know, this happens. I think we need to really have a heightened awareness about it. Okay. Um, is this product designed to replace uh, Retrax-type credentialing products? No, you know, rep these products work in a little bit different fashion. So rep tracks is really to keep track of the rep, meaning who is in their facility and from what company they represent. You know, this product is once you get in the facility, it's really meant once you're in the operating room, then at that point, are you wearing clean surgical attire? And then, you know, we have a <clears throat> relationship with Simpler, which also is involved in the rep vendor management tracking system. So we have worked in combination with them. So it's not meant to replace rep tracks. I think this is meant to ensure that those folks in your operating room have clean attire, that they are managed appropriately from a vendor management perspective, and they're, you know, they're controlling your costs. I'm not sure it's meant to replace rep tracks. I really think this is a whole separate product. Okay, and I think we've got time for one more. Um, how do the reps buy the scrubs? So, you know, it's kind of like now we have all these intricate uh, money management solutions, so we can do it on our phone. But what the rep does is they register online. They then put payment information into their registration. When they get to this scrub port, which you see right here, they insert all of their information, their credit card is billed, and their scrubs are dispensed. So it's all, you know, it's all seamless. They have an account, they can keep track of their account, they can um, see how many scrubs they bought, all of that stuff is on there. That's super, well, we're coming up to our hour, John. So 
Thank you for such a great and very informative webinar, and thanks again to our sponsor, Rep Scrubs. Uh, just a reminder that one lucky attendee today will win an Amazon gift card for completing the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. For information on our upcoming OR Today webinars, please visit our website, ortoday.com forward slash webinars. So thanks again, once again, John, and thank you for everybody to join us, and hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again next time. Linda, thank you very much. All the contact info is there if anybody has any questions or needs any more information. Thank you, John. Have a good day, everybody.